I'll, yeah, no, thank you. And I will also turn on closed captioning. I I also have a question, Sean. I, yeah. I can't remember policy for the Chaos Project. In other communities that I'm a part of, we boot out things like fireflies.ai. Oh, I didn't know fireflies.ai was a thing. Other, that's other not a person. People, other people can bring them in. I I think since you're logged in as Chaos Community, you can probably yeah. bring them out. Yep, I'm going to remove them. I didn't realize okay. that was... Uh, it's something individual, thing. individual people, like I can set one up and point it at a meeting. It's just something people do. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. No, I don't like to be robotically recorded. <laughs> yeah, we record the meetings anyways, and we have the transcripts. So there's, there's no reason to have those initial. That makes sense. Thanks for pointing that out. I, I did not understand that Firefly was not a real person. So I appreciate you bringing that to my attention. I just thought it was a cute, clever name. Um, so the, his, the historically, um, one of the things that we're trying to do is, uh, in the case of Augur, we in software, there is this map uh, that exists. So we have all of the published metrics, which exist um, here on our website. And if we go to metrics, um, you can see that they have them classified. And if I go to contributor metrics, one of them could be newcomer, well, newcomer experience is probably a bad example. Um, so newcomer experience is one where a software tool like Augur or Grimoire Lab would not be able to um, provide data on this metric using trace data because it's really about providing guidance uh, and survey information. So trace data is the data that we derive from the GitHub API and from the commit logs or the GitLab API and the commit logs. So this particular metric like newcomer experience isn't well suited. And so there, there'll be some metrics that are not well suited for tools and they won't be mapped to tools. There are others, uh, bus factor perhaps being a classic example that we can use tools to gather the underlying data and then produce a metric from it. So if I look at bus factor, um, it is the description, um, how many contributors can we lose before the project stall? And the way that we've defined bus factor is uniquely quantitative and specific compared with other metrics, where we've defined a bus factor as the smallest number of contributors that make up half of a project's contributions. And, and so we can look at all of a project's contributions and basically look at the top contributors and just go down from the most frequent contributor until we hit 50% of all contributions to get the bus factor. Um, and then there are some very specific uh, details about bus factor here. Um, and so now we have this, we have this metric definition for bus factor. And within Augur, we have documentation, which some of you are familiar with. And I'll put these in the Zoom chat if anyone is in a position to take notes, that's helpful. Um, or the Zoom check. Oops, so that's the doc one. And Inside of this, there's REST API documentation. So Augur presents many of the metrics on the front end uh, through either 8-Knot or the Augur front end. However, the API is intended to provide, quote unquote, all of the metrics. And so one of the first things um, that you will see is if you pick a metric, like uh, get all repos, uh, So if I look at contribution count, you'll see in here um, that this shows chaos, chaos metric definition. And this is in fact, uh, you know, the count of contributions is a, a, at least at one point was defined as a chaos metric. But if I click on it, it is almost certainly not going to go anywhere. It's gonna go to page not found. And the reason for that is that over time we have, 
defined metrics and then had the URLs uh, moving fairly frequently, like often multiple times in the same year. So we stopped maintaining this, this URL uh, inside the documentation. And the way that we have sort of fixed that is in the metrics spreadsheet, which is at the top of our notes. If I go there and stop, please feel free to stop me, raise hands, ask questions, because I don't know if I'm blowing through some of this context too fast. Um, but in all of the metrics now, we have this uh, WordPress page ID. And what that WordPress page ID accomplishes, it is, it is a permanent link to whatever this metric is, so that if the name of the metric changes or the grouping of the metric changes, it is no longer going to change the URL and render uh, navigation to this metric uh, moot. So if I go to risk, um, and what was I looking at? I was looking at contributions count. Uh, So contributors count is, is probably a better one that I'm sure also doesn't have a, a link. Yeah. So if I look at contributors count, I can then go back to the spreadsheet um, and find contributors count. Uh, Is there a way to search an entire Google spreadsheet, not just one tab? So one of the one of the ways that uh, this committers, okay, the committers metric seems like that. And it looks like I picked a bad one because there are no. Oh, yeah, here it is. So this is the committers. Committers is different than contributors, though. Oh, there we go. Let me see if this will search the. So the other thing that's happened is some metrics that were created in one group, okay, uh, can have been moved. I don't want to search for people. Can you search an entire? That's that's just searching the menu for menu items, not searching. Oh content of the doc. Is there a way to search a Google spreadsheet or is that not actually possible, which I guess I didn't realize. Maybe we're down a bit of a, a bit of a hole. Rabbit hole, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I'll, I'll try to pull out of the rabbit hole. Um, uh, Uh, okay, so there are there are these permanent links. So if theoretically we went to contributors count, there is a metric for contributors count somewhere in that spreadsheet. And uh, maybe one of the things that might be helpful is if we just created a list of all the metrics and their permanent link that exists um, in one spreadsheet, because it does seem that using the current spreadsheet to navigate all that it's not, it's not easy to see the whole base. So perhaps that could be an action item is to just create a spreadsheet that maps all of the all of the metrics on one page with all of the links. But let's presume that we found the contributors count uh, metric uh, and its permanent link. Um, so from a documentation perspective, um, <clears throat> one second. If I was to go to the auger repo, the, the documentation, so when we're looking at this documentation for, for the API, in auger, that is under the docs directory. And 
underneath the docs directory, it is under source. And under there, it's under REST API. So the REST API, um, uh, this is just a standard restructured text that specifies it, makes it navigable from the readthedoc.io. And then all of the work is in the, this specification.yml. So if we search for contributors count right here, you can see that the contributors count URL um, in this, uh, what's called a YAML file or a YML file, the URL is here. So one activity, so activity one is to sort of update the existing endpoints uh, to ensure that the documentation is pointed in the right place. Um, and that that would be, you know, for anyone interested in doing documentation updates, um, that would be that would be great. Um, any questions? Is this I'm talking a lot. I'm curious uh, if anybody is if this is helpful to anyone uh, or if if you're following what I'm saying. Let me just take a minute to solicit some feedback. Just a note that I I have a script that maps the metrics to um, the canonical URLs. So I'll that's, create a spreadsheet. That's right. I'll that's create a right. spreadsheet and link it. I knew this. Okay. I knew this from last summer, but I fell out of my brain. Thank you, Don. Yeah, no worries. Thank, I'll thank run you it. so much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I I completely forgot that Don did that. So that's awesome. And that. Uh, I, if I had done that beforehand or remembered that beforehand, it would have been even better. So, so one thing is to just sort of make sure that the metric definition and the API documentation is uh, to the with the if the current metric exists that we're mapping to the correct metric um, on this link. And you'll see here that um, where that is mapped is going to be not on GitHub anymore, but to our WordPress site. So. That's the thing one, that's the documentation update part. So the, the next thing is maybe, uh, I think it might make sense for me to just actually open up the auger code a little bit and help folks navigate um, or help you see where API creation currently takes place. Is, does that make sense to everyone? Or are there specific questions about how to contribute that maybe we can talk about before I do that? Okay, you know, it says makes sense. Okay, so I'm just going to open it up here locally because it's a little bit easier to navigate. All right. Okay, so. Um, I'm just going to change my share. So this is, um, I use a text editor with a browser and for the purposes of doing, um, demonstration, it's easier with actually a text editor because I can show you everything. So underneath Augur, uh, in the Augur repository. API endpoints are created right now um, here under Augur and under API. And there are two main folders. SSL is just related to deployment of the front end and view is also related to deployment of, of the front end. So the two folders that contain API, so there are, I should say, there are some APIs that do not address metrics that just address the functioning of the software. And those those are the APIs that are under the SSL and view directories and API. The directories that we'll be concerned about are under the routes directory and the metrics directory. So metrics is for metrics that are defined using a standard metric template that we developed. So this makes the requirements for coding less onerous. Uh, because there are some what are called decorators. So if I just look at the contributor file, 
um, this will generate a contributor API. And so if we're going to create like a new file like this, you can see we've tried to group things logically into different files based on the context or the domain. So commits, contributors, dependencies, experimental is a bucket for metrics that have not been defined by chaos yet. Um, insight is for uh, machine learning API. Uh, then there's issues, which should make sense, messages, platforms, pull requests, releases, and repo metadata. Um, these are all, you know, logical domain oriented groupings of, of metrics. If, if I want to look at creating a new metric in, in one of these spaces, um, and maybe why don't I go to issues because I'm actually going to demo something that for pull requests under issues. So if I have uh, issues right here, the first thing is if I wanted to create a new file, these, these imports are the same. Um, you will see this decorator called register metrics in only the metrics that are in the metrics directory. And that's because every metric in the metrics directory has the exact same method signature, which allows us to leverage um, shared code in this decorator, which makes generating the metric easier. <clears throat> um, so this this uh, metric is uh, issue first time opened, and these parameters are all going to be the same. And these, of course, are the actual implemented parameters defined down here in this comment. So repo. One of the things that I want to do without um, confusing everyone too much is presently there is a endpoint for doing statistics or doing re uh, metrics by a repo ID and by a repo group ID. As a, as a practical matter, the repo group ID is less meaningful. And I think we can simplify a future version of the API by removing the repo group ID queries um, and just beginning with the repo ID queries. Um, however, the way that they're implemented right now is by default, uh, it uh, takes a, a repo group ID um, and then specifies the default for repo ID is none. And so the way this works at the time of execution is the first thing we check, well, the first thing we do is we set a default begin and end date because these are also optional parameters. Um, but you can specify a begin and end date on the command line. Um, and that's that's done with, um, uh, you would do that just by, it would be the question mark, begin date equals 2023-01-01. And if we wanted to have another, uh, it would be end date equals 2023-06-01. This is just an example. So that's how that's implemented um, at the URL. Um, for begin date and end date. Uh, once we set that default, if it's not specified, um, we check if there's a repo ID, and if there is, uh, we'll just focus on this. Uh, it, it it does this issue new contributor text SQL, all right? And so this SQL hit the database that is uh, underlying Augur, the Postgres database. And it, it says, you know, select, it does a date trunk. So whatever the period that you specified, so that can be a day, week, or month, or year. So. It defaults today, but you can also spec you can specify a different period besides day, um, like week, month, and year. And I think oftentimes uh, week, month, or year is possibly more useful. So the first thing it does is it gets the date of the issue. Um, it does a count, uh, and it gets the name of the repo, and and then it selects it from a subquery, which looks at the GitHub user ID. Um, the data, the issue created date um, and the repo. And then it's where this repo ID equals repo ID um, where it's not a pull request. This is no longer necessary, but that exists historically. 
um, and where issues are created at the begin between the begin date and the end date. And then it's grouped by the two non, uh, from a SQL perspective, you may or may not be familiar when you're using uh, an aggregation in a selection, you typically, so the count is an aggregation, you would typically group by the other uh, values selected, in this case, issue date and uh, repo name. Uh, and so then it does group by that and order by that, which is which just makes it ascending by default. Um, so this is how uh, we create a, um, uh, this is how this is how we construct a metric endpoint inside of Augur. And if I wanted to, for example, have this um, issue opened date, if I wanted to have this issue first time opened and I wanted to, and then uh, this is also standard down here, I should mention, uh, with all the imports, then we just create this, this is this result is exactly the same uh, in every case. And so if we wanted to issue, so one of the things we don't have is, uh, I thought I'd, so let me stop and just ask if there's any questions about this. All right. Okay, I'll just uh, go on then. So this, this, this looking at the basically by date time, how many issues were opened in a given date time, uh, we can see that this exists for issues. And if I open up pull request.py um, and I look for opened, that's reviews, that's acceptance. We don't actually have a metric for pull requests that lets us see the number of pull requests open in a time period. We don't have an endpoint for that. So one one thing that we could do is uh, create one. And one way to create one is if we have a metric for one thing like an issue, but we don't have a corresponding metric of the same type for a pull request as we can start with just creating a copy of the pull request metric like this. So I'm sorry, the issue metric, which gives us again, the first issues first time open. So it just gives us by time period, how many issues were open. All right. And the first thing we need to do is we'll change this to pull request. First time opened this method we're using this register metric. So the message, the method signature will be exactly the same. The description of the parameters will be exactly the same. The cautionary begin end date text will be exactly the same. Um, what will be different is where we pull this data from. And <clears throat> so the way I would start this is, let me, can I see a show of hands? Uh, how many people have a, a SQL client that they use, like some kind of SQL client that's not the command line. And how many people would need one? So for example, um, uh, dBeaver is one commonly used one. Um, SQL is another. Um, does anybody have one or do you all need one? PG admin. Okay. All right. Jupyter, uh, Jupyter notebooks, Python script. Some folks don't. Okay. I see in chat now. All right. Okay. Um, so one thing I would say is if, if you need a SQL client and, and you want to work on APIs, uh, please, uh, please use the Augur channel to I guess, request help. And maybe um, in the next meeting, I can um, I can provide some uh, example SQL client demonstrations and also provide some links. And if you have tools that you use, like PG Admin, you know, please provide a, a link 
to in the URL would be extremely helpful. So All right, so I'm just going to share. So right now I've copied this. This is the SQL for the first part of this. And after I've changed the name, so the only thing I've changed so far is the name um, for this similar metric. And the next thing that I would need to change is the uh, SQL. So I've copied the SQL and I'm going to open up my SQL client now and just paste this query into here and keep that up there. And I'll, I'll, it'll be more clear in a minute why I'm keeping it up there. Um, and then have another one again down here. Okay, so the reason I keep this up here is because, because I'm going to get rid of this these variables in order to test a query um, like this. So I've replaced the parameter period um, with day, week, or month. So period is day, week, or month or year. So I've replaced, I've replaced that. Um, this is the same. The next parameter I have is down here, the repo ID. And I'm just going to create one, use the number one, because that is all that I need. And then for begin date, I'm just going to add in 2023-01-01-01. Sorry, keyboards are hard. Um, and then, uh, All right, so I'll put those as the between dates. And so now this query, this query will run for issues if I've replaced that correctly. So that, that query works for issues. So I've, I've correctly replaced the parameters. And now the next thing I of course need to do is change this from issues to pull requests. So I know that the name of the table inside of auger is pull request there is a there are a couple of ways that you could know the name of the pull request table um, one would be pull requests um, the other would be um, if you open a table browser and look for pull like if you know you're looking for a pull request and you find a pull request table you could open it up confirm that it looks like pull request data um, you could also message in Slack just to confirm that you know what you're trying to do and that this is uh, the correct table to access. Uh, and I'll wait while well, that's coming. It looks like it's uh, struggling slowly. I'm probably on my wrong Wi-Fi for it to go as fast as it should. Now that I think about that. All right. Well, it's uh, all right. So this this it does in fact looks like pull request. It's got a pull request ID, a pull request URL. Etc. So I'll go back here and I'll change the table to pull requests. One thing about Augur is we're going to join repo, the repo table on the pull request repo ID equals the repo repo ID. Repo ID is the same across all the tables. So you can confirm that just by looking at here, repo ID. And so I'll change this to pull requests dot repo ID equals repo ID. And then this gets changed from issues to pull requests. Now here, um, this is a legacy piece of code, but it used to be that it is still the case that the GitHub API returns pull request data when you get issues. And it used to be the case that Augur stored all of the pull requests in the issues table as well as the pull request table because of that. However, now we only store pull requests in the pull request table and only store issues in the issues table. So this pull request is null 
for issues is no longer necessary. And it's definitely not necessary um, when we're trying to get a pull request. So in this case, we can remove that. And we would just, uh, this would be pull request repo ID equals one and pull requests created at uh, between here and here. So, and this would be, now I want to look at uh, group by, oh, wait a minute, this is issue date. So I want to make this be maybe PR date and then PR date and PR date. And now I should be able to run this query and I think you yeah. still got one issues statement in there. Oh, do I? I thank you, Don, for then the men in the first select. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that probably just would have generated an error, hopefully. Um, so if I run this now, you can see below I've got issue date. Um and so the first issue date with this parameter is the 11th of January and the 18th of January and the 25th of January, uh, 212. Uh, so if I just, I just copy uh, that, I'm just gonna put this up here so that we can see that it's different. Um, and then I'll run pull requests. I'll run this query. H user ID does not exist. Okay. So the GitHub user ID exists in the issues table, but does not exist. Really, yeah, does not exist in the pull request table. Which that just, okay, it looks like um, that would be an inconsistency in Augur and that we do have the GitHub user ID in the issue table, but not in the pull request table. However, that doesn't really pose an issue because semantically, I don't actually need to count the GitHub user ID. I can count star um, and make it easier. So with that simplification, oops, I still have it somewhere. Yeah, you're still selecting on it in the first or the second select statement in the prom. Oh. So that uh, that reflects an inconsistency in Augur that's kind of, uh, I would have to go through and spend a little bit more time making sure that I don't have that somewhere. I'm of course surprised that I don't. Okay, PR source. Okay, so the closest thing I have to it is the um, PR Augur contributor ID. Um, This makes it more complicated, but it also makes it right. So I can always navigate from the internal contributor ID to the GitHub ID this way. Um, there's a contributors table. PR auger contributor ID. Uh, 
Um, and that lets me have the GH user ID, theoretically. So I realize this is now a more complex example than I anticipated. But let's see if this works. Column contributors. I think it's the beginning of that line that contributors, because now you've joined a couple of tables. Oh, um, and I see. I see. Well, okay, let me take another shot at this, which would be an. If this doesn't work, I'll hack it differently. All right. Wait a minute. From, oh, okay, wait a minute. All right, I see what I did here. Welcome to Stupid SQL Tricks. I will back out of this if it doesn't work this time. Column contributors. All right, I, I will not trouble you with the sequel on this. I don't know why. I'm mixing and matching, but column contributor. I don't see where I'm selecting the column contributor. So I'm confused. Oh. I guess maybe I can't combine this and clause. Do you know how to do this, Don? No, I'm not familiar enough yeah. to off the top yeah. of my head to debug that. Okay. No All right. Time. Let me let me just back this out then and we'll just uh and we'll just make this. We'll just use that for now and use the auger contributor ID in the select statement group by this as well. And then well, pull requests created at does not exist. So go over here and find what we call it here. Should have been created at, obviously was not. ER underscore created at. So. All right. I guess I have that somewhere else as well. Uh, okay. ER underscore. All 
All right. So now we have, um, you can see looking back uh, for issues, we had the 11th, 18th, and 25th of January, 212. Here we have the 1st, 5th, and 9th of January as the top three. So you can see um, that, our, that our data um, is in fact different. And the actual outcome for the API, even though we changed this internally, doesn't change. We're still seeing the date and the count and the repo name. So this query then becomes useful for uh, if we put the parameters back in, we can then start creating our endpoints. So if I take this, I know this works and I wanna go back up here. I'm gonna make this a little bigger. Hopefully it doesn't ruin anybody's ability to see it. So you can see that this was period. I'm just gonna put period back down in here. And next one was this repo ID. So I'm going to put repo ID down here. And then we had begin date and end date parameters. And I realize I've reached the end of time here. Um, so, um, let me just wrap this up. And uh, what do, so my first question is, so this is the first part where we've identified the query that we need for the endpoint. So if I take this now parameterized query and move it back into Augur, into the code base, uh, Here, I would I would take this uh, like this, and I would put in my new query. Take out the semicolon, and then just tab it over like this. I might want to call this PR new contributor, and change this to PR new contributor just to be consistent. Um, and now I have a parameterized query for for the repo part of this. And what I would suggest is that um, we just create the repo part of it um, for now. And then we could test this um, repo construction. Uh, we could test this at runtime um, by just you know doing a local development run of the API to see if it works. Um, and then the, also the next step would be to create the documentation or the YAML entry for this and connect it to uh, the GitHub, the associated GitHub metric. So I think given that we've gone an hour here, um, I would invite folks to begin looking at this. So there are, there are two places to start. The first place is to check the YAML documentation and make updates. The second place is to, uh, to try and create this endpoint. Um, so I would recommend uh, cloning Augur and maybe trying some of these steps. Try to, try to just sort of follow along with the video and try to get as far as we got here today and then um, we can continue asynchronously in Slack or you could, um, we could continue this um, at the next meeting. Any closing questions or comments? Yeah, um, I, hey, Sean. I think this is um really I think this is really so good an initiative. We've had folks from the Chaos community, <clears throat> more so from the Chaos Africa chapter who always wanted to like um find a way to be useful in contributing to Agar. And I think so far what you've highlighted is really easy to attack. You, you don't need to like know too much about the whole code base. So I hope 
um, I hope people can um, really join in and jump into the contributions, but I really wanted to appreciate the initiative of bringing this up and uh, making it at least um, open to communication and also yeah. to help other yeah, I believe I believe I believe the code base is so big and we may not be able to wrap our heads around it on the first try or second try. But if it is, if these right. are so consistent, um, uh, I'm sure if people continue to being like active here, um, we may get the best out of it. So yeah, thanks for this um initiative. I appreciate no, it. No, no, you're welcome. And and it's my pleasure to help uh bring more people on board. And yeah. I think the the most likely thing to occur the first time you try to do this um, after watching the video or while looking at the video is you, you'll run into some kind of obstacle that you didn't anticipate or some kind of weirdness that you didn't anticipate. So when those things happen, I encourage folks to use the Augur channel to ask those questions. Um, and then we can work to resolve them asynchronously um, or set up ad hoc calls as necessary. Yeah, sure. All right. And I do want to let we'll people go because there's five minutes to the next meeting. Yeah, for sure. All right. So thank you, everybody. Um, I will I will hopefully see you in the Augur Slack for now. <laughs>